In today's episode, we're going to look at MyVar Edit. I'm going to go through the code base with you guys and show you how everything works and give you a general lay of the land. And um, yeah, it's going to be exciting. Uh, you're watching MyVar, my name is Emil, and I hope you enjoy. Right, so before we begin, let me show you the progress I've made since the last video. And in the last video, I did some experiments, primarily on autocomplete, because I've never done anything like it, and I wanted to learn. So I was working on... Um, you know, like fuzzy comparing strings and so on and testing different algorithms. And yeah, and I'm kind of happy. I'm going to delete all this code because it's not remotely appropriate for long-term use. It was just a purely an experiment. So let me show you. Uh, if I type, like for example, Joe, um, which then I have a dictionary popping up and when I hit space, it will autocomplete to that. <clears throat> and I need to work on this because if I say step, all right, it says to move the foot in walking, <laughs> um, but I want to step it. And at the moment, I'm kind of just jeppoing that, um, the ed or ing's onto the end of, with affixes, you can see the little folder at the end here. Ah, file, I mean, lol. At the end there, so stepped onto the, now I'm gonna, I have dyslexia, I remember, so if I type el, leave, el, leave, mm. El, it's kind of hard to type with a microphone in your face. Elevator. Um, elevator. There we go. Um, there's the one I want. If I hit space, it will... Um, elevator. There we go. If I hit tab, I cycle the autocomplete. And it will... Um, uh, yeah. Well, apparently I, I probably spelled it. Oh. Uh, well, the one time I actually spelled something correctly. Elevator is how I normally type it automatically, and if I had space, it will, or if the distance between the selected word and the word on the screen is one, and whatever algorithm is being used for a metric, then it will autocomplete it. Otherwise, you have to hit uh, Shift Enter, I believe, or Control Enter, to first to apply. <clears throat> so yeah, Joe stepped onto the elevator, um, listening to the sounds of echoes. Playing games of cat and mouse. Suddenly, the door grinds to a screech. Ah, oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Suddenly, the elevator stops and the doors jar open, revealing. A wall. The air, and you see there it auto deleted my comma. I need to make punctuation in the proper engine. The elevator, elevator, is stuck. Stuck. No, no. Oh, typing is hard with the microphone. There we go. Stuck is stuck in the shaft. Um. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been experimenting with, in terms of. You know, like having a dictionary at the uh, at, in my autocomplete, and when I'm editing a programming language, <clears throat> my goal is going to be to kind of you know um, have contextual dictionary. So only when I do variable naming or write comments or so on, the dictionary will pop up. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I was just experimenting with. But in the last two videos, um, it's been brought to my attention that it's kind of hard to follow what's going on um, in the the um, Time lapses, which is fair enough. So I decided to go through every line of code in this episode and just kind of, you know, take you guys through it uh, so you can slowly absorb what's going on here without it going at 400x. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so we have two uh, projects in our solution, MyVar Edit, which is the editor itself, and then MyVar.edit.truetype. And the TrueType is just a TrueType file, font file parser. Um, and yeah, so the way this works is the program creates an editor window. The editor window is just an open TK um, window. And then we just enable some 2D stuff. Uh, yeah, so I can, if I enable this, for example, you can see it running in wireframe mode. Yeah, it is open. There we go. Uh, so if I say, hello, world, whatever. Blah, 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 blah. See, it's in wireframe mode. Uh, it doesn't look like it because the text is so tiny, but yeah, it's in wireframe mode. Anyway, um, 
So then we draw the buffer. Uh, the draw buffer gets initialized. And we'll get back to what the draw buffer is soon. We enable blending and, and uh, transparency and we disable cold facing and depth clamping. And we enable multi sampling. Which I don't think this is strictly necessary because I'm using a multi sample, sample render target. And yeah, so we have the multi sample render target, which we just bind a bunch of buffers. Then we use 16 samples. Um, oh, please don't quote me. I don't know. I think it's FFXA. Oh, um, what do we do here? We, in the samples, we say render buffer storage multi sample. Uh, let's look it up, shall we? Is open gel a um, fx ff uh, sa? Is that what you call it? I don't know. Let's see. Well, yeah, fsaa. There we go. So, uh, when you enable multi-sample, and then when you do... Yeah, sorry, you can't see my web browser, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, it does appear to be FF, um, SA. So, yeah, interesting. I don't know, I might be wrong. Um, but yeah. So, then we just kind of hook that up, make it 16 samples. So, yeah. And then we bind it up, and then we have a, a blit function here. And, see, we're binding frame buffer zero over there. Um, that means split it to the, the window that's currently the current window. Um, you could split this to another buffer, especially when you're doing post processing. Um, but yeah, no. so I, and then I just split, split over the the color buffer, and that's how I'm. So I'm rendering to this buffer, and then I I uh, just split it onto the screen later on. So yeah, I'm split it, and then I swap buffers. <coughs> then. Um, so that's that. Then when we resize, we do the classic viewport thing. We resize the draw buffer, which involves disposing it, um, I believe. Well, first we init a new orthographical matrix for the 2D rendering, and then we get a screen size thingy over here. Then we dispose the target, yeah. Which, uh, yep, there we go. We dispose all the buffers and stuff, and then we create a new one. Uh, this hasn't happened too often, so I'm not, it's slow, but meh. How often do you resize a window, right? And then we bind the target. We clear the color uh, to black. Then we clear the color and depth bits. We add the uh, average frames per second onto the list of frames. Uh, I only keep a thousand of those. Every thousand I remove the one at zero. So that's only the latest FPS values. Then we draw the text error itself. We draw the FPS. We flush the draw buffer. And then we bind the screen. I use buffer zero is always the screen. Then we blit the target. And swap the buffer. Okay, so uh, what is important in here is the draw buffer. Oh, oops. and the draw buffer might seem a bit silly at first, because <laughs> um, it is kind of perfuous, perfuous, however you say that, um, pointless, I guess. Um, and then, so it has draw rectangle, measure string, and as well as draw string. And uh, that's all the functions it has, and then it just has some fancy overloads. So you don't you don't have to pass a, a color or a rec directly. You know you can just pass raw float. So that's just overloads of that. Um, and this shader is no longer used, but oh well. Anyway, so the rectangle shader uh, renders the rectangle. <laughs> oh wow, go figure. As well as the the font stuff. Then we have the uh, orthographical matrix, which is the two D. Uh, projection without any depth, the screen size, a quad uh, uh, that is a mesh, and it's like one by one, and then I use a scale matrix. So I just draw, always draw the exact same quad on the screen. I scale it using matrices to, to make them different sizes and get them all over the place. And then the true type font file. And here I just load up uh, hack, the hack font. And we'll look at the, the true type file format in a moment. And then I load up the shaders, which we can quickly look at that. It's just a simple position, MVP, color, you know, easy peasy. Um, and then it just gets, takes the, applies the MVP, the view model projection matrix onto the position. It uh, takes the color in this uniform and applies it, which is semi inefficient, uh, but oh well. Um, you, you could put that in the um, meshes, uh, buffers uh, directly and load it as a, a vertex. 
uh, attribute, I think is what you call it. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, so then, yeah. See, here we use the transform to get it to the x and y coordinate, the scale to, to scale it to the proper size. And then we apply these things. And then we uh, set the color and then we draw the quad. And this is how that works. This is just some um, glyph matrix related things. Um, so yeah, we just read information and then use that and then draw string is the same thing except we use the actual matrix to go ahead and apply the rectangle shader and draw the mesh for that specific character. So that's how that works. Why do we have a draw buffer when it's not actually a buffer it directly draws? That is because later on I want to actually make it a buffer and instead of doing this the flash does nothing right now. We do invoke it um, in the editor window. But it does nothing. And what is supposed to happen is these are supposed to queue this up in a concurrency or a, a concurrent safe list of some kind and store it all uh, be between renders. And then when you flash, it will go through that collection of, of instructions and actually execute them. And the reason is because we want to support multi-threading at some point without having to, uh, you know, juggle the open gel context like it's hot potato and having the rendering on one thread. That is the point. But for now, I'm not doing that. But this will make it easy because I, instead of doing this, I copy this into the flush method and then I just replace this code on the inside with a queue of this instruction and it will work. Oh, wrong button. Um, and yeah, so that's great. But you know, right now I don't need all that complexity. So I just just better future proofing. From that from that perspective. Now, as for rendering, these most of this code I copied from my game engine. Uh, one of my old implementations. We have some colors. We have RGB. It's based on floating point integers. So zero is zero, and one is two five five, equivalent in RGB, and everything between is you know one zero dot one, zero dot two, zero dot three, etc. And here you can do RGB, and that's the translation to all of that. Then we already looked at the draw buffer. We already looked at this. And then we have the glyph cache, which just caches glyph meshes after they were generated and this is just to speed up performance because you know regenerating a mesh and sending it to the GPU every single frame would be a nightmare in terms of performance. Here we have the matrices class so it's just a float array of array like a what is that called a jagged array I believe so yeah and then we have multiply and divide and identity and orthographical matrices. Here we have a mesh we have a VBO a IBO and the array buffer which is new to me. Um, this code was for like OpenGL 3.1 and I upgraded to 4.6 I believe and um, if you don't bind an a ABL you just get a blank screen even though you don't you're not using it so that's weird that cost me a half a day of bug hunting Ugh. anyway um, so here we, we load up the vertex data which is in this case just two things uh, into this data array then we bind the buffer pop the data into the buffer we do the same thing for the indices, put that in a buffer, you know, put in an element array buffer and uh, bind everything, and then we unbind everything. Always unbind stuff. You, you'll see when you start using libraries in game development with OpenGL, if you don't unbind stuff, you will break other libraries uh, that you're invoking because, um, yeah. So <laughs> you want to unbind stuff because of the global state, it can be quite messy at times. I have the dispose, which I guess I need to add a delete buffer for the array buffer, but oh well. Um, and then we have the draw method, which will bind the uh, vertex array buffer, will enable the vertex attribute array, will bind the VBO, and then we'll give the offsets, uh, you know, the stride and all that stuff. Bind it, draw the actual elements from the IBO, and we just bind it, and then disable everything again, again, to preserve global state. The multi-rendered um, sample Multi-sample render target has width, height, and then three buffers, which we allocate one by one. And I guess I could replace this now. Uh, the, the latest version of OpenTK wrapper can directly, doesn't need to use out, but oh well. All right, so we just assign that, bind it, add the def, add the color component, add the draw buffers component stuff, check if shit went south. Then we bind the frame buffer. Unbind it, sorry, we unbind it and then we do the viewport stuff because we were screwing with buffers. Then <clears throat> um, 
we which that's wrong technically after unbinding this needs to be the main windows viewport but it just so happens to always be the right so that that I can yeah, let's just mark that as a potential um, edge case uh, this can break if window point anyway just for my future note for myself <laughs> anyway here we dispose everything oh, here we bind it and viewport it in the event that we actually use it and then the blit code we bind this frame buffer we bind frame buffer zero which is the one the swap buffer that the window that's actually staring on the screen it corresponds to and then we blit it over um, so i don't have to use a quad to render it just this the chili way of doing it do believe it's slower though i'm not sure a point, you know, this is kind of self-explanatory. I don't use vectors in this case because, you know, I'm doing 2D rendering, not, and I don't see the point in, in that. A rectangle, which is, again, self-explanatory. Size is also self-explanatory, and we'll look at shader in a moment. This is the vertex. Um, yeah, it's it's like this for, to make expansion easier, uh, which, yeah, and I, like I said, I copied this code and just cleaned it out from my game engine. So I removed a bunch of stuff. This is probably perfect and pointless but oh well and then we have uh the shadow which is messy <laughs> so we create a program bind the position attribute attribute um, i think attribute i'm not sure how, if that's attribute if all the way anyway then we add the vertex shader and the fragment shader but we append the define vertex and if we remember we looked at the shader this is the fragment shader this is the vertex shader and that's how we know which one from the same file is being used. We compile it. So when we go about adding it, um, here we go. We just do add program, add program. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. Bad, bad copy pasta. There we go. And you know, it's classic, just link it, get the program, check the status, validate, get the program, check the status, and so on. Compile it, you know. The basics then when we do a vector thingy we if the uniform doesn't contain it we add it which means we get the uniform yep location if it's minus one shit went south and then we check the data type of the value and based on that assign it properly which this is messy because i just copy and paste it out of my game engine and it this data types don't necessarily match up properly but it's working fine for now so yeah so that's all the rendering code the editor code is broken this entire folder is getting deleted uh, because I was just wanting to test stuff. So I just have a giant switch statement where I hard coded every input. But yeah, don't do that. A simple docking panel for you know constraints, and then this was me experimenting with every possible <laughs> fuzzy comparison algorithm I could find on NuGet with the Webster English Dictionary, which is just in this json file so yeah which i load up uh, when the program boots and uh, yeah and yeah this is terrible i'm gonna delete all of this it was just me experimenting um oh that's just an empty file great and then this is just all the code that handles the typing logic um, i honestly just wanted to experiment with with um what you call it uh, autocomplete so up next we have the this bit this is the, where the fun stuff I mean, this is the part I enjoyed the most so far in this project is parsing out the tree type file, file, file format and uh, we have a header a horizontal table a vertical table long matrix C map and glyphs so we load up the file you know open up the stream load the all load bytes whatever and both point to this method load and load uh, this is stupid this is something I regret yes and no <laughs> See, the thing is that uh, what I was initially doing is uh, I was um, doing this, so loading all the ASCII characters, but when you get compound lifts, which is when, for example, double um, point or a semicolon it can be a comma and a, and a period combined. So, But then it would actually take the plain old comma and the plain old period and uh, apply transformation matrix to them to combine them. And yeah, so the, I mean, they don't have a offset in this in in the C map. Those characters necessarily not all characters have a, a Unicode character. 
Um, and so when I uh, loaded this up, loaded them out, and then closed the stream down afterwards, that kind of screwed me over. I ended up finding a solution uh, by doing this. But yeah, so uh, they, they, there needs to be a compromise somewhere in there. Um, which, how, maybe I'm just being stupid. How big is this file? Let me check. It is 300 kilobytes. Okay, you know what? Next time when I approach this, I'm just going to load the entire damn file into memory <laughs> and keep it there because 300 kilobytes is nothing. Anyway, uh, so lesson learned there. Uh, this is stupid. Um, yeah, let's. Stupid idea in the end. Yes. Anyway, so we have this reach tract, which is kind of fundamentally a huge part of. And oh, you know, I was. Oh, oh sorry. I, Anyway, I was experimenting with writing hacks for CSGO for the fun of it. Um, and um, and so I was reading out protected memory and serializing the structs out. And um, I ca was reading other hack clients on, on GitHub, the source code, to learn how they approach the problem. And then I felt so stupid. <laughs> you see, what I was doing is I was... Um, uh, when I was using this, I would, for example, just come here, marshal the size of T, and read out the, the buffer, and then go through all the fields and uh, reverse them and, and apply them like that, right? And essentially um, casting a, a pointer or an offset into the stream into a struct. And then I would use this overload to read the proper data type, this find overload method. Uh, where am I using it though? Let's see. It's been a while since I've touched this code. Here, find overload. So I was, yeah, yeah. So that was to read struct. Sorry, I'm being stupid. To read an array, I would find the proper overload in a binary reader. Um, where is it? Yeah, oh, sorry, in bit converter. Yeah, yeah. So I would get using uh, that. I would get the bit converter. This is stupid. I was reading the code base and I saw this guy was using this method to pull strings off directly, uh, to pull uh, uh, in integers off directly. So you'll note when I use this read array, if we look here, here's a great example. I just wanted to read off a U short, so I read it off and then I just took index zero. That was how I was reading in U short, but. If I click on the decompiler code for U short in the STD, guess what? U short is a struct. <sighs> so all this time, instead of doing this madness, I could have purely just invoked the simple um, read struct. So let that be a lesson. You don't need this garbage. Um, you don't need this garbage to to read a simple integer. You, this code as is would have worked, which drives me mad, but oh well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and I implemented some, the, the CMAP. So, other the, the true type found file works is, um, let's go to the top. You have the header table, which has some basic information in it. Then you have the horizontal metric table, which gives you information about how to, um, where to, how to space the characters horizontally, and then the same goes for vertically. Then you have the more matrix stuff. Anyway, then then max p it would give you the extreme edge cases of each, the, the edge cases uh, of each kind of metric in the, the one file. And then cmap is the one where that maps a Unicode character, or an ASCII character, or whatever, uh, it, it depends on the format, to a offset. And then you would use the glyph Offset that would be the uh, this one I believe yeah yeah the glyph offset table oh uh, um to to convert this offset into an offset into the file where you can then read the glyph itself and that's what I'm doing here I'm just mapping these glyphs and reading them out and read glyph there we go and what that does is it will um read the the glyph like this um and read out the struct for the glyph description, and then I do this madness, because it doesn't conform to a set boolean, although I uh, um, struct all the way through. And um, 
read the contours and the instruction length, which I've never used this. I don't know why. I, I read it out so that all the <laughs> it reads properly, but I don't know what to use that for, to be honest. Uh, and then over here, we get the outlines and decompress it, and then we read out the points. And that's how we get the, the dots for the font. Um, and the curves and so on. And then finally, over here, um, I start adding in curves. And then I start adding, uh, converting them to shapes. Then I take the shapes and add the midpoint rounding. For that is to make it curvy, so that is uh, using busier curves. And then over here, I apply the busier curves, I believe. Yes, so I apply the busier curves. And then I triangulate it using libtest.net. And then I take the triangles and store them. And finally, if it's a compound glyph, we uh, load up load up the matrices, and then I don't apply the matrices over here. Instead, with that happens up top here, where we go through every glyph and we check if it's a compound glyph. See, if it's a uh, component is zero, that means it's compound. Then we read out the compound components, get it deep copy its shape of triangles, and then if it used matrix, you transplant the matrix, apply the matrices, and add the triangles and then do it for every compound in the compound glyph. And that's how this whole thing is constructed. Um, and yeah, so we have the glyph here, which is just data structures, you know, containing the shapes, contour points, triangles, curves, and components. And uh, well, then we have just all the raw uh, structs that I deserialize out of the file. And yeah, that's how that works. I do hope you enjoyed. In the next episode, I'm going to start working either on making the rendering stuff like this whole docking panel stuff work better, or we'll start thinking about how we're going to approach. I might write a few, you know, text uh, like a, uh, a text data structures, like a gap buffer or ropes or whatever. I, I will have to read about it because that's one of my weak points, and see which one is the fastest and which one will work the best for us. So we can uh, start building an actual text editor using all the loose components we have laying around. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited. If you have any feedback for me, please let me know. And um, please do consider subscribing and leaving a like. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.